Thanks again for joining us, and I'm going to hand it over to Will now. Well, I echo uh, Jason's sentiment and just say it's wonderful to see you all here. Some of you I know, and uh, some of you I'm meeting for the first time. Uh, but it's my pleasure to be with you tonight uh, to share some stories from the stained glass. Um, many of you who know me know that uh, since I came here in 2015, uh, learning about the stained glass and sharing the stories has really been a, a project of mine I've found great passion in and uh, shared with. Um, I think my parents are on the call, but originally Jason had asked me, um, you know, are you going to share this link with anyone else? And I said, no, all my family's sick about hearing a stained glass at Mercersburg because I talk about it so much. Um, but I love sharing these stories and I love um, bringing to life what is truly a remarkable building um, and one that plays such a profound uh, emphasis in our school community life um, and brings together so many generations in, in a way that so few spaces in our community can. So tonight what we're gonna do is we're gonna focus on the influences and the stories uh, from the First World War that are in our windows. And to begin, I wanna take us to June 1st, 1919, which was a Sunday. And that evening, the school community met together for a solemn occasion to commemorate those who had died in the Great War. Now it had been almost seven months since the Armistice Day and later uh, in, that same month of June 1919, the Germans would sign the Treaty of Versailles. We don't know why the school waited so long to commemorate the alumni who had died within the war, but on that evening, Dr. Irvin began uh, by saying this, we are met tonight to show our affection for the 48 brave lads who placed their name on our high honor roll by dying for us. Like the knights of old, they went forth on a great quest. They held aloft the torch of life and waved it. They added to the spiritual wealth of humanity. By the very manner of their going, they gave us an assurance of immortality. Over our school and national life, they shed a golden light. They were convoyed by the angels because they died in so great a cause. They prove that love always carries with it the possibility of suffering, that dying is triumphing. In their going from us, they made clear what the master meant when he said, greater love hath no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. After this brief introduction, each boy's name was read out and Dr. Urban placed a white rosebud in a silver cup. And after this uh, solemn uh, occasion, this kind of ritualistic reading of the names, Irvin concluded by saying, these dear Mercersburg lads are not martyrs, but heroes. Someday every name will be done in bronze in our chapel or some other building, end quote. Now we could spend a whole 40, 45 minutes talking just about this quote. I mean, Irvin uses language of knights on a great quest, adding to the spiritual wealth of humanity. I mean, he really lays it on. The idea is that angels convoyed these boys to heaven because they fought in such a great cause. But what I want to focus on is his last bit in that conclusion, how he was going to honor these young men. And while on that Sunday night, they only knew of 48 who had died in the war, uh, in the end, we would know that 55 alumni died serving in the First World War. Interestingly enough, uh, today a student of ours, Caroline Cronick, who's a graduating senior, wrote, uh, gave a presentation for her senior capstone project, how there was actually a 56th um, who died in World War I, who died just a few days before the armistice uh, was declared, and he was, died when a civilian shot him in Canada. And Jason's going to send you guys the uh, link to her presentation. Uh, it's really, really great research. That's all original research done by our students. It's really fantastic. But overall, 1,600 Mercersburg alumni would serve in World War I. They fought in all the key battles the United States fought in and in all areas of the United States military. Overall, our alumni won 93 different medals within that war. And as Irvin mentions in that conclusion, he said, we will honor them in the chapel or some other building. 
And that's because the chapel wasn't built in this time, but it was definitely in the planning process. Um, our chapel was the 30, culmination of 30 years of dreaming, planning, and working by our founder, Dr. William Mann Irvin. The property the chapel sits on was not initially a part of our school, but Irving always had his eyes on it. This is a picture facing north uh, towards Kyle Hall and where Lenfest Library is. Irving's daughter, Hart, talks about how she and her father would go on walks with the dogs, and they'd often end up here. Irving would place her on this uh, fence that you see in the picture, and he would look out and say, this is where I am going to build my chapel. And knowing the bravado and confidence of Irvin, I have no doubt that he said it was his chapel. The piece of land would be acquired in 1906. Here's another image of it. Uh, this is taken from looking southeast uh, from where the Bergen Center is today. And the fundraising would begin in 1916. However, World War I would halt the fundraising and the building of the, the space, but it would also give it added meaning. Dr. Irvin really did not want to spare any expenses on this building. And so he hires the architects out of Cram and Ferguson. And specifically, Ralph Adams Cram becomes the lead architect in the chapel. Cram was uh, the leading figure in the neo-Gothic revival in America at the time. He builds West Point's chapel, Princeton University's chapel, amongst others, including Swarthmore and St. John the Divine in New York City. And really, Ralph Adams Cram is the gold standard of neo-Gothic architecture in the United States of America. Now this Gothic revival that was occurring at this time, both in the United States and in Europe, had an emphasis on stained glass. And Irvin, like every other part of the building, was extremely involved in the design, the ideas behind the stained glass, the design of it, and finally its execution. And I believe that's because Dr. Irvin understood the importance of stained glass, that stained glass conveys a message we know that Irvin wanted the students to come in and to recognize the figures in the glass and be challenged to live their lives as these figures had. So we don't just see figures from Christianity, but we also see them from literature, we see them from history, and we even see some contemporary figures uh, from missionary ranks. In fact, we actually have an alumni's parent in the windows in the martyr's window, um, there's a guy named William Reimert who was an, uh, a missionary in China who actually died the same month his son graduated from Mercersburg Academy. So Irvin is kind of creating this space where these people become talking points. These pieces of art become talking points. Um, and not just talking points, what I mean by that is conversation partners with the person who's looking at them because they can engage with them because they know the stories. And I think that's why I love the stained glass so much, because the more I learn about it and the more I engage with the stories, the more the pieces of stained glass come alive. Because stained glass is a lot like any art or image. Once we know the meaning behind it, it takes on a whole new life of its own. For example, if I show you this piece, uh, this picture, you see uh, men and a baseball diamond, given its size, we think it's a, a professional MLB diamond. And it doesn't look that much, you know, doesn't look that odd. We stand at attention at certain times at baseball fields and we sing the national anthem. But when I tell you that this picture was taken on September 23rd, 2001, at the first Mets home game after the September 11th attacks, this picture takes on an added weight, takes on added meaning. We not only think about what happened that day, but we think about where we were when it happens, when it happened. We think about the way our nation rallied around, uh, united during that time, in particular around the Mets and the Yankees, who were both having great seasons that year, and everything that was caught up in uh, baseball that season. So stained glass is no different. Once we learn the stories behind these, the pieces that we look at take on added meaning and can engage with us. Now, seven of the 34 pieces within the chapel were dedicated to Mercersburg alumni who died in World War I. The two we see here are the Temptation of Christ window on the left and the Chevalier de Bayard window on the right. Along with these are the five windows at the front of our chapel, which are uh, the nativity scenes done by Wright Goodhue. Wright Goodhue was 20 years of age 
when he uh, completed these five pieces of glass. Goodhue would die at the age of 26, and this is one of only two, piece, uh, two multi-set pieces he ever created. Now, while these pieces were dedicated in honor of alumni who had died in the First World War, Irvin didn't just stop at uh, memorializing these men through dedications. He wanted an entire window to symbolize the service of Mercersburg alumni, both who died, but also those who fought in the war. And for that, we go to June of 1925. And in our archives, we have a letter that Dr. Irvin wrote to a Mr. Henry Coulter. And in this letter, Irvin is just overwhelmed with gratitude and excitement for the window that Coulter would donate. In a previous letter, Coulter had enclosed a check that would, that would cover the entirety of the window that Dr. Irvin envisioned to honor the Mercersburg alumni who served in World War I. While after talking over some logistics of the piece of stained glass, Irvin gets personal in this letter. And he says, I'm anxious to have this window be the most beautiful thing of its kind in the whole country. We want this window to be glorious, not only in its coloring or beautiful effects, but also in the choice of the themes and details and subjects which shall be placed therein. In certain respects, it will be the most unique memorial in the entire chapel we must have it created in such a way that it will be exactly right, end quote. And what Coulter donates and what Irving comes up with is the heroic Christianity window. This is in the west, upper west transept of the chapel, and it's uh, the second largest window um, within the chapel. And like all the pieces in the chapel, it is just dripping with symbolism. But the symbolism in this one is particularly fascinating. And I'm going to walk us through it, starting at the top and working our way down. So this window is called Heroic Christianity. And as I said, Irvin wants the young students at the time, the young boys at the time, because we were an all-boys school at the time, to be able to emulate uh, what they see. So here at the top, we see what's called the multifoil, as well as pieces of tracery, art, and quatrefoils. And I'll talk you through these terms as well. So the multifoil with Jesus in the middle is what kind of catches our eye. Now remember, this is the heroic Christianity window. So we see Jesus in a, a knight's armor and holding a sword sheath ready to pull it out. This is not Jesus take the wheel, Jesus my shepherd, Jesus my forgiver and comforter. This is the heroic military Jesus. And we even see that with the words that are around him. Fortitude, honor, justice, and mercy. So right from the beginning, we see this is a very different type of window. To the left and right of Jesus are what we call tracery pieces. These are smaller pieces in the glass that often tie into the larger uh, element, but they're not as uh, predominant. But these ones are really cool because they give a nod to the biggest, one of the biggest uh, technological advances of the time, which was aviation. On the left, we see the symbol of the RAF, the Royal Air Force, the British uh, Air Force. And on the right, we see a Seminole chief's head. And that was the insignia of a group called Lafayette El Scadrier, which was Americans who fought, fought and flew under the French flag. So we have these two really interesting kind of nods to the advances of the time. Below those three pieces, we see what we call quatrefoils, quatras and four. And in the left quatrefoil, we have the U.S. coat of arms. And in the right quatrefoil, we have the French coat of arms, the French being one of our key allies in the war. Now, what ties all of these pieces together, these five pieces, are these gold stars you see throughout. And wouldn't you happen to know that there are 55 stars, one for each of the alumni who died in World War I? I actually posed the question to one of my, this, our students today, do we need to try and redo the stained glass to create a 56th star now that we know there was a, another alumni who passed? But right away, we not only see the war being honored, we see this idea of a heroic elements of faith, but we also see this honoring of those who had passed. As we go down in the window, we're gonna see what we call lancets. Now, lancet is just a term for a piece of stained glass that's pointed at the top. And within our four lancets, 
we have four saints. And all of these uh, saints have something to do, well, three of them have to do with kind of a militaristic element. And the three that have to do with this kind of a military or battle are the th going from left to right. St. Michael, the archangel on the left, next to him, St. George, and then St. Louis. On the, on the far right, we see the angel Gabriel, um, which is interesting because Michael, George, and Louis all have got swords or spears. Gabriel has a quill. Um, in the biblical narrative, Gabriel is always the revelator. Uh, in the book of Daniel, he's a revelator. He's the one who tells Mary that she's expecting Jesus. He's actually even known as a revealing prophet in Islam as well as Latter-day Saint theology as well. So Gabriel has this long line of being a revelator. Now, while we might understand why archangels end up in a window, why do we see St. George and St. Louis? Well, St. George is the patron saint of England, and St. Louis is the patron saint of France. And who happen to be two of our most important allies in World War I but England and France? So not only, once again, are we seeing these ideas of heroism and this militaristic service, but we're also seeing a nod to our allies. Now, as we go further down the window, we get to what we call the predella. The predella supports the main part of the window, but it's at the bottom. A lot of the times in our other pieces of stained glass, the predella will be a separate um, biblical story that goes around to the rest of the glass. So for example, in the temptation of Christ window, we see the temptation of Job in one of the predellas, a supporting cast. But this one is truly a, a fascinating piece. Um, and uh, what we see here are 12 heroic Christians. From the left, we have St. Paul. All the way to the, the far right, we see um, the unknown soldier of World War I. And these heroic Christians, once again, kind of mirror everything that's going on in this piece. Now, while they're very interesting to be in here, it's really fascinating how Irvin decided who was going to be in the stained glass. Because what occurred was Irvin actually sent, had a national kind of solicited the support and the ideas of people from all over the country to, uh, to decide who was going to be in this piece of stained glass. In September of 19, 20, 1925, he sends out 98 letters to people in business, in journalism, in government, including the president and vice president, and as well as education, uh, secondary, collegiate, and graduate level institutions. And in these letters, he asks, uh, he describes the window that he's creating, but then he goes on to request a response. And he provides three categories that he would like to pick from for these people. And then he asks for not only to, them to have a category, but to provide six to eight names that could be helpful. So the three categories he provides are the world's great leaders, people who struggle to lift up humanity, great military leaders, and finally figures from, the, lead, uh, figures from the First World War. And what occurred was, as Irvin would receive these letters back, not only them voting on the category, but then making some suggestions around names, and he would tally up the votes. And we know he tallied the votes because our archives actually still has the tally sheet. And this is a pretty cool thing. So we see up at the top, he has those categories. We had um, 58 respondents, so out of 98 uh, people, pretty good rate. Um, for that first category of the world's great leaders, people who struggle to lift up humanity, 22 votes. For great military leaders, we had 35 and uh, one solo vote for people from the First World War. So not only do we see those tallies, but we see that below he placed every single name that was suggested. And people who got numerous votes, he put tallies, multiple tallies next to their name. So the leading vote getter was George Washington. And this is uh, the image of Washington that is within the window. Now, while the people that ended up in the window got a lot of votes, what's really interesting to also look at is the people who didn't make it. Um, and the top five leading vote getters who did not uh, enter the window were Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther, 
Robert E. Lee, Oliver Cromwell, and Theodore Roosevelt. So these were all men who received a considerable number of votes but did not make it into the window. But as we go through, there are a lot of really interesting characters and historical figures who received votes, one of which is the seventh Earl of Shaftesbury. Now, I know you're all very familiar with the seventh Earl of Shaftesbury, and you're very frustrated he didn't make it into the window, but just to provide a little background again, uh, the seventh Earl of Shaftesbury was a member of parliament in the 1800s, and he actually uh, did some pretty amazing work campaigning against child labor in England at the time, and he ran an extremely successful campaign to uh, get legislation passed that made it so that small boys could not be chimney sweeps, because uh, what they found was these very small children were being used to get into these very tiny chimneys. And he also uh, made a lot of provisions for rudimentary education and housing to be provided for homeless children in the country. So it's a really interesting figure when you actually read about him in those ways. Darwin received a vote, Gandhi received a vote, and Florence Nightingale received a vote, and so did William Wallace. Um, if only Mel Gibson had ended up in the stained glass, it would have been quite a thing. But the Florence Nightingale one is really interesting because uh, the vote for Florence Nightingale comes from the Episcopal Bishop of Chicago, a Mr. Uh, a Reverend C.P. Anderson. And Anderson's response is actually somewhat typical of people within this. Uh, within this. And uh, while many people were enthused by this idea, there were also many people who were very uncomfortable with the idea of having a militaristic window within the chapel. Anderson writes to Dr. Irvin, replying to your letter of the September 23rd, uh, September 23rd, I prefer your selection number one for the windows in your chapel. I am not a pacifist, but I do not like the idea of exalting military men in a boys' school unless they have some other qualifications than military genius. Of course, Washington was the father of our country and Chinese Gordon was a saint as well as a soldier. But in my opinion, the figures should be chosen to represent men and women who struggled for the uplift of the race. For instance, I should rather have Florence Nightingale than any military leader. And Irvin saved all of these responses. We have them all in the chapel. And this is not uh, an isolated case. Uh, we selected this one because uh, Anderson's his very concise uh, reply to use. But this is not an uncommon response to this. Um, and this is a fairly normal trend that we see across Christianity and uh, society after the war. This idea of heroism in Christianity and this ideas of muscular Christianity that had been promoted through the YMCA and Teddy Roosevelt, people became very uncomfortable with them and kind of backed off after World War I. And so this window was met with a little bit of nervousness. But Irvin uh, had the votes and he knew what he wanted. So he creates this window with these heroic Christians within it. But he doesn't just place these 12 Christian figures within it. He also places uh, medals above each of the 12's heads. And in total, there are actually 13 different medals in the window. The 12 on the top are uh, 12 of the 93 most prestigious medals won by Mercersburg alumni. But then also we have on the bottom the uh, victory medal that was given to all uh, American soldiers who fought in World War I. But also within this window, as you see popped up, are different insignia, and we believe these are different regiments or battalions that uh, Mercersburg alumni served in. We have not gone through and done that deep of a dive, uh, but we're fairly confident in that manner. Now, these... Uh, uh, these medals, they are of the United States, but we also have medals from Italy, Belgium, France, and England. And the one from France particularly caught my eye uh, because my great-grandfather, William Butcher, won this medal, the Croix de Guerre, in World War I. Um, he was not a Mercersburg alumni, but when I saw this, I grew up with this medal in my house. And one of the first things that stuck out in this window was this. Uh, and so it was pretty cool to find. But when I dove into and kind of dug into who won it at Mercersburg, I found also quite an amazing story. 
And the winner of the French Medal of Honor for Mercersburg alumni was this man, Andrew Courtney Campbell Jr., class of 1911. Campbell was trained with the French and joined Lafayette El Scadrier, uh, which I'd mentioned earlier was those Americans who were flying underneath the French flag. And their planes would have that Seminole chief's head on it to designate uh, who they were. Now at this time, uh, airplanes, flight, and particularly using them in battle is the wild, wild west. So these are kind of a mix of adventurers and wild, wild west guys. And when you read about Lafayette El Scadrier, there is definitely a little bit of wild, wild west mixed with a healthy dose of animal house uh, in their stories. For example, these guys had a baby lion they kept as the pet at their barracks. And the stories are pretty entertaining. If you've kind of run out of things to read, I'd suggest looking them up. But while testing a, a new engine, uh, Courtney Campbell lo loses his lower left wing of his plane. Remember, at this time, airplanes had a bottom and a top wing. And he's at about 5,000 feet when this happens, and he begins to spiral downward. Somehow he gains control of the plane and he landed it safely in a beet field 10 kilometers from the base. The story goes that uh, the members of his unit rushed to find him they brought, and they didn't expect they'd find him alive, but they found uh, Campbell unharmed next to the plane with a sheepish grin on his face. His only request was that he could drive the ambulance back to base, uh, but the thing is he didn't drive it the short way. He actually took a different way that had uh, quite a few more bars and cafes uh, on it. And uh, as the story concludes, they did not miss one stop on that road, if it was a bar or a cafe, celebrating his uh, narrow escape from death. Now, while it's a great story and it earns him uh, this medal, the Croix de Guerre, Andrew Courtney Campbell Jr. plays another um, an interesting element. Because on October 1st, 1917, he enters a skirmish with German planes and dies. Dies, excuse me. And on October 1st, 1917, Andrew Courtney Campbell becomes the first Mercersburg alumni to die in war. And I struggle, you know, not struggle, but I doubt that Dr. Irvin, as he placed this window together, didn't have the memories of having Andrew on campus when he placed this medal in there, or when he places the nod to Lafayette El Scadrier in the window. And what it would have been like for him to think of the young men who won these awards, to think of the ones who had died, and to also relive some of those memories that he had with them on campus. And we can all, I'm sure that was a really powerful experience. And so this is one of my favorite little parts of this window. The most famous medal within the window is the Medal of Honor given out by Congress. It's the highest award we have for military in our country. Uh, now by, my, uh, by the research I've seen, roughly 7.4 million Americans serve in World War I. And of those 7.4 million Americans, only 121 Congressional, Medal, uh, Congressional Medals of Honor were given out. What's not amazing is that we had one winner, but Mercersburg Academy actually has two different alumni who won Medal of Honors in World War I. Admiral Joel T. Boone, class of 1909, is on the top. Admiral Boone would go on to be the pre doctor to the presidents. He invented what we call Hoover Ball, uh, which is very popular amongst CrossFit, uh, in CrossFit groups and whatnot, where you take a medicine ball and throw it over a volleyball net uh, he did this to help Herbert Hoover get in shape. And below him is Ralph Talbot, class of 1916. And Ralph Talbot is quite an exceptional uh, member of our academy uh, and of our long blue line, as we like to say. Talbot himself has a window dedicated to him. This is the St. Michael slaying the dragon window. It's in the lower east transept. And it's a pretty amazing window. Uh, before we chat about it, I would like to tell you a little bit about uh, Ralph Talbot. Ralph Talbot's story with Mercersburg Academy begins with a boy named Sherman Lowell. Sherman Lowell was planning to attend Mercersburg in the fall of 1915. His brother Francis Lowell had graduated in 1910. But unfortunately, on July 4th, 1915, Sherman Lowell passes away. 
And at his funeral, Ralph Talbot was one of the pallbearers. As the casket came out of the church, uh, Francis Lowell comments to a, uh, a friend that Ralph Talbot sure does look a lot like their brother who had just passed away. Now, Sherman and Francis's sister Mabel must have been within earshot because she quickly interjects, that's Ralph Talbot and he wants to go to Yale. Francis and Mabel talked it over and shortly thereafter talked to Ralph and asked if he would like to carry on in Sherman's place at Mercersburg Academy. Now, whether this was just him providing uh, Ralph's admission or Sherman's admission spot, or whether this was them also covering Ralph's tuition, I'm not sure. But without uh, Sherman Lowell and the Lowell family, Ralph Talbot would have never made it to Mercersburg Academy. He was here on campus only one year, but boy, did he make the most of it. He was a member of the Marshall debate team, the cross country and track teams, a member of the 15, a member of the Academy Literary Board, a member of the Mercersburg News Board, and a member of the Carricks Board. And he was loved here. He was seen as a natural and quick leader. And I have not found even a slight passive aggressive comment about him in the writing of him. He's one of those students who reminds me uh, of a lot of our, some of our PGs or some of our one year students where you go, I am so grateful that we had them here. And oh, do I wish we could have just another year or two or three with them on campus. Just one of those students you don't want to leave. Ralph would end up going to Yale and he'd enroll in the fall of 1916. But he only spent a year there because on October 26th, 1917, he enlists in the Navy to serve. He ends up transferring and joining the Marine Aviators and ends up uh, just like Andrew Courtney Campbell uh, becoming a pilot. And there are really uh, two days in, um, <clears throat> excuse me, two days in uh, the month, or sorry, three days, excuse me, in the month of October 1918 that really define Ralph Talbot. Two of them for his heroism and for his winning of the Congressional Medal of Honor. Um, and I don't have a better way to sum it up than to read you part of the excerpt from his citation. On October 8th, uh, 1918, excuse me, I lost my place. While on a raid, Tal uh, Second Lieutenant Talbot was attacked by nine enemy scouts and in the fight that followed, shot down an enemy plane. Also, on October 14th, 1918, while on a raid over Pithom, Belgium, Second Lieutenant Talbot and another plane became detached from a formation on account of motor trouble and were attacked by 12 enemy scouts. During the severe fight that followed, his plane shot down one of the enemy scouts. His observer was shot through the elbow and his gun jammed. Second Lieutenant Talbot maneuvered to gain time for his observer to clear the jam with one hand, and they returned to the fight. The observer fought until shot twice more, once in the stomach and once in the hip, and then collapsed. Second Lieutenant Talbot attacked the nearest enemy scout with his front guns and shot him down. With his observer unconscious and his motor failing, Second Lieutenant Talbot dived to escape the balance of the enemy and crossed the German trenches at an altitude of 50 feet, landing on, at the nearest hospital to leave his observer before returning to his base. Now we have uh, letters and other accounts that describe it in more detail, but they read like action films. You know, Talbot ducking and diving with his plane to buy his gunner, who's already wounded, more time to fix his weapon. They return to the fight and continue to shoot down enemy planes. Uh, one of the accounts said that his gun actually jams and that he didn't, um, he actually bluffed a German plane by flying straight at it to try and deviate it away. But realizing his gunner's about to die, he clears enemy lines at only 50 feet and actually saved the gunner's life. The gunner lived after that. I mean, it's a truly amazing story. And for this heroism and for these actions, Ralph Talbot would win the Congressional Medal of Honor. But unfortunately, it would never be pinned on him in a physical way because it was uh, given to him post 
because on I told you there was three days that made up Ralph Talbot's time and defined him in October of 1918. And unfortunately, the third was October 25th, 1918, when Ralph Talbot went out on a training exercise, had an engine malfunction, crashed and passed away. Uh, I gave this presentation uh, to our students uh, in 19, I'm sorry, not 1917, excuse me, in 2017, and we gave it uh, almost 100 years to the day of Talbot's enlistment, uh, it, actually on October 26th, which was 100 years the day after he passed, or, and I'm sorry, 99 years the day after he passed, and 100 years the day before he enlisted. So it was this really amazing moment that we got to share the story of Ralph Talbot with our students around such a milestone for him. The school would unveil a portrait of him in 1926, just months before the chapel would open. And this piece of stained glass would be given in his honor. And I think it's fitting that I think the most rare and unique piece within our chapel was given to the, one of the most rare and unique members of our community. The piece was done by an Irish stained glass worker, Michael Healy, who was really known as a savant and a really quite on the cutting edge of stained glass in the early 1900s. Uh, Healy's a great character. He was actually a tradesman in England. And about the time of the Irish Civil War, he was a part of a number of art, an artistic guild that all moved back to Ira, Ireland. So none of their work could be deemed English. And he did our piece in Ireland. Um, Healy uh, was really quite an artist. We see this uh, particularly in the halo of this piece. Notice how the color kind of blends together and it almost looks scratched in. It's very different than the other pieces we've looked at today. Um, there's just something very raw about it, almost scratched in and unique in this kind of radiating red closer to St. Michael's head and moving out yellow from it. We see also this interesting blend of color uh, in his armor with these silvers and whites and blues that are all placed together. I'm gonna go back a little bit. Um, sorry, I didn't have a good uh, transition there. Uh, for the contrast with those blues, with the reds and purples and greens that we see within the window. St. Michael is famously known for slaying a dragon. And we see the dragon on the bottom left corner Michael is shoving his uh, spear into the dragon's head. We actually see the dragon's foot, um, I believe I have a close up, closer up of that here, um, kind of over his face, and we'll come down to that here in one second. Yeah, right there, as we can see it there, and at the top we see one of its eyes. And I love this, all these artistic elements about it, but my favorite artistic element about it is the in loving memory of Ralph Talbot. Now, I'll be totally honest, um, a lot of the dedications of the windows are even hard to read, even when we have close-ups of them. Uh, the dedications, unfortunately, for many of these windows, the majority of them blend into the glass and you overlook it. But you can't overlook this one. It's this black and yellow, it has this very Steelers feel to it and say what you want about the football team, but their colors kind of really are very forceful. And it's in all caps. It's, I mean, this window forces you when you look at it to remember that it was given in loving memory of Ralph Talbot. And what I love also is not just that it forces you to remind, it, not for, just to remind you of who gave it, but who donated it is really quite amazing as well. This was donated by the, this window was donated by the Mercersburg News which as you know, is a student organization. It's the only window in the chapel that was donated by a group of people. And it's the only window in the chapel that I know of that was donated by students. And I think that speaks volume to the figure that Ralph Talbot was um, even after his time and what high esteem he was held in as a rare individual. The window is also rare uh, because Healy only has, to my knowledge, five pieces of stained glass in the United States. Only three full windows, and there's two he contributed uh, multifoils to. So it's a truly, probably the rarest piece of stained glass within the chapel. I mean, I think we, you know, Nikolai Dicenzo and the Dicenzo Studios were easily one of the most famous uh, glassworking studios in the country and in the world at that time. 
but we've got 11 of their pieces in the gla in the window in the chapel alone you know this is one of only five in the country from healy i think it speaks volumes to who uh talbot was and the elements he was held in so once again you know as we think back the images what are we trying to convey through this glass this elements of heroism not only of saint michael slaying the dragon but also of who ralph talbot was um and you know while we don't have many dragons in real life that we slay this day and age we all have a dragon in our life regardless of what that is um and this window i always love looking at this window and it reminds me and tries to draw me through, you know, how I can slay the dragons in my own life. And then we spring that up and talk to the students about that at times and how we can have that courage as well. Now, Irvin didn't just stomp at the stained glass um, to honor the young men who fought and died in World War I. Irvin would dedicate the chapel to the 55 who died. Before the early 90s, uh, when it was rededicated to be the Irvin Memorial Chapel, it was simply known as the Memorial Chapel in honor of those 55 who had died. Now, all of you have obviously spent time on Mercersburg Academy's campus, and you know that you can see the spire uh, for quite some ways. It's actually the first marker that you finally made it to Mercersburg, that first glimpse of the chapel. It's this welcome relief. Um, I'm a huge cyclist, and the farthest I've been able to see this is on Route 30, which is about seven, eight miles as the crow flies from campus. Um, so you can really see it from a long ways away. And I think about how Irvin um, dedicated this to the 55 alumni who died and how it really served as a marker of their courage and sacrifice in their character. And it doesn't just serve that for our community, but it's almost a beacon of those reminders to the entire surrounding area as we can see it for so long or so from so far away. Irvin, I do have to say also, just as a aside, um, he also dedicated the chapel to the mothers who sent their sons to Mercersburg. Um, and I love to remind, particularly our faculty and staff of this, that from the foremost, you know, we are reminded that we are uh, cared with the raising and the education of kids, uh, of people's children, and the great honor that we are given as faculty and staff in that. And Irvin recognized the trust, particularly boarding school parents, place in us in sending their students to uh, be educated here. And so while, yes, we call it the Memorial Chapel, I always think it's very important for us to remember that second part of Irvin's dedication as well. So in all these ways, Irvin uh, honors those who served. But he still made good to his, on his promise to place a plaque in bronze. Now, before a lot of you got here, Eric was telling me about his time in the narthex as he stood there as a head chapel usher looking at the come unto me window. But if you've spent any time like Eric did in our narthex, you'll also know that there are plaques in every single uh, alumni who has died in war, serving in a war in the United States military's name is on a plaque within our chapel. And to the left, we see the plaque that Irvin dedicated, excuse me, to the alumni who died in World War I. Making good on his promise uh, to place their names in bronze so that we may learn them and their stories. And that's what we hope to do. What I've been privileged to do and I've been privileged to share with you, <coughs> excuse me, but what we hope to continue to do, to remind people that these pieces of art in this building are not just beautiful pieces of architecture and stained glass, but there's stories behind them. And there's not only just stories of great heroes of literature, the Bible of history, but there's stories of members of our own community. Um, I am reminded on a daily basis how fortunate and blessed we are to be a part of this Mercersburg Academy community. And it's my hope that we can emulate the sacrifice and service and love that those who came before us did, those who were placed in the glass did. And it's my hope that we can teach it to our students so that they too can join that long blue line and live up to the high standards we've been set, but also to set those forth for the community members that are to come. So that we can remember uh, those who not only lay down their lives, but also those who know what true love and service looks like. Thank you all so very much.
Th thank you, Will. You, you know, I, I, I think uh, you could tell that it was a, a great talk because people were so uh, in, engaged in the talk, they didn't have time to, uh, to type a chat or ask a question. So, you know, if people, as people process it a little bit, feel free to kind of reach, reach out or uh, chat with people. And, you know, I think that kind of your, your Ed words really are, are what it's about. You, you know, we, we see the chapel and we know the chapel, but we don't really know the stories behind it. And, what a great opportunity to to learn and, and to grow and, and uh, appreciate what 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 the chapel has to offer. Uh, yeah. you, the the other you, you know how how great it is you know we kind of talked that you know this is really raging uh, both the the country and, and generations here and, and we all have our own uh, appreciation of the chapel and if anyone wants to share their appreciation through the chat or some story that they remember what the chapel meant to them you know feel free to uh to try you know reach out through the chat or or anything like that we uh jason can i cut in on you there as we begin the chat i would just like to say as as one thing um i am I'm pretty knowledgeable about the stained glass, but I am not a World War I expert. <laughs> Some of you may, who have uh, learned a little bit more about that war may have to help. Um, I can also answer questions about other pieces of glass. We were talking about the come unto me window uh, beforehand, but I've pulled up uh, all of our other images of it, and I'm happy to share some of those if people have questions about other windows or how we're using the chapel. Um, we use it as a teaching tool as well. Uh, we have a, our New Testament course now uh, is called the Gospel Through Stained Glass. And the stained glass is actually our primary way we uh, teach in the class. So I just wanted to throw that out there. But I'd love your questions and things like that. Um, I see there's one. I'm, I'm just going to go off of your names, uh, Theds or T Heads, or I'm, I'm sorry if I, I don't know what your first name is. You asked in the chat, why did Irvin not pick some of the top vote getters like Lincoln Lee? Martin Luther, et cetera. I think that it's because he chose those great military heroes. Um, of all those people, the only one that's, uh, you know, we could really classify with the military is Robert E. Lee. Um, but, you know, Lincoln didn't serve in the military in that way. And so I think that might be one of those ways. Um, one could make the argument that um, why is Paul, the Apostle Paul in there then? But, you know, maybe Paul is the first milit the first field general of Christianity, if you will, and being this kind of missionary. Uh, but that would be my guess um, as to why those men uh, did not make it into the window. Other questions? I'd love to. Something, yeah. Just a comment. The, in the uh, upper west transept window, the quadrifoils, mm -hmm. too, uh, you know, I looked at them for years. Uh, and I thought it was France, not because that was one of our allies, because, but because that's where many of the boys ended up. That very well could be. Um, in some of these, I, I think you're definitely right, Walter, that we definitely had many people end up there. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm scrolling up. I'm actually just going to pull that part up and zoom in on it so you guys can see what we're talking about. Um, one of the unfortunate things about uh, the stained glass is we have a lot of Irvin's thoughts through the process, but we don't have his original request sheet. So um, we don't have as many um, of those specifics, but no, I think that, that that would also make a lot of sense as to why um, Britain or another coat of arms is not there. Right. Any other questions or comments? I also want to make sure uh, to thank uh, Jackie Grace, who's uh, from our office and really uh, helping run this this whole program. Uh, she's also been recording this session, and we'll be able to make that available uh, also to you um, later. I'll I'll make sure to to follow up with you with everyone, and I'll include uh, Will Will's email address if you have any questions that come to you afterwards. And I'll also make sure I'll include the link to the program that he was talking about earlier that a student uh, really just presented earlier today as her senior capstone process uh, project that looked at the uh, the kind of missing alum from, from the plaque. Uh, um, she did a great job with that. Yeah. We've had a few questions come in on the chat. Sue Berkey, 
um, thank you for your question. You asked, um, uh, in regards to Ralph Talbot, where is the portrait? Is it still at the Academy somewhere? Um, the answer is yes. I don't know specifically where it's being hung currently. Um, in the past, we've had it in the Edwards room, I know, but we've also had it um, in the Bergen Center. Uh, we've had a number of different times it's been featured there. Um, so that would be a question for Doug Smith, our archivist. Um, but Doug does a really good job um, moving some of the art around and making sure that we're showcasing things like the Ralph Talbot portrait um, and placing some context for it so our students and others who visit the Bergen Center can see it. Um, uh, to that note, I'll also say Sid Coretti, our art teacher, does a great job of providing uh, wonderful art there as well. Um, and Katie Titus, our head of school, does a great job of showcasing student art at her house. Um, and Sid and those people actually do a lot of those um, elements, uh, bring that in. Um, another question, do we know the age range of the boys when they died? I don't know specifics, but we, you know, if we think they graduated in 1916 and 1911, they had to be, uh, you know, early 20s. Some of them were, I mean, Talbot, geez, he graduates in 1916. He passes in the fall of 1918. He, he's got to be somewhere 20, 21, depending on how old he was when he graduated high school. Uh, but we're all, I, to my knowledge, we're talking in the early 20s. Um, when I went back on my notes, I was really bummed. I'll have to find it. Doug and I, the archivist, tried to figure out how many of our alumni percentage-wise served in World War I because, you know, we were still a young school at that time and didn't have as many alumni as we do now. Um, I want to say it's something like 20% of our alumni served in some way, shape, or form in World War I of the alumni at the time. Um, but it was a huge number uh, given that we were such a young school and whatnot. Um, William Bittiger asks, can you speak to the role President and Grace Coolidge play in the building of the chapel? Um, yes, I can. So the Coolidges uh, sent both of their sons to school at Mercersburg Academy. Grace Cap Coolidge would be very involved with the chapel. She was at the groundbreaking, the cornerstone laying, and at the dedication of the chapel. And then Vice President Coolidge uh, was at the uh, uh, groundbreaking. Um, as we know, uh, Calvin Coolidge Jr. passed away uh, in between his ninth and 10th grade years in the summer. He was playing um, tennis and play all day at the White House and played without socks on, developed a blister, and it became infected. And essentially, he died of a form of a staph infection. And you know, you think we're only 10 years before penicillin um, and the medical advances and how dangerous even a blister like that could have been back then. Um, but the Coolidge's actually dedicate the cross that's at the, uh, at the, that sits on our altar. Um, and it's really quite an amazing piece. I'm just seeing if we have an image of it in the book. Um, I don't think I have an image of it on, um, unfortunately, on, the, uh, um, on my computer. Otherwise, I'd show it. Um, but what's really fascinating about that is that um, Grace Coolidge actually writes a poem that was placed in Good Housekeeping magazine on the third anniversary of their son's death. Um, and it, I, I can't read it without almost tearing up, particularly now that I am a parent. Um, as Jason mentioned, I have foster children and um, it's this really amazing poem about a mother loving her son. And it's called The Open Door because it asks her son to leave the, door, the gates of heaven ajar so that she can glimpse from afar uh, the beauty of his face and that she asked to hold, for him to hold his hand and to lead him home, lead him back to heaven. And it's a really powerful poem. And it actually transforms that cross in, from a nice memorial into kind of this love letter and this beautiful mo place from a, uh, from a mother to her son. And it's really quite an amazing thing. Um, and I apologize, I'm looking down because I'm scanning. I know I have an image of it on this computer of the window uh, they made also in honor of Calvin Coolidge. On the way up to the uh, Carillon Tower, we have a window that was produced in honor of Calvin Coolidge's uh, talk at the groundbreaking. And I'll share that with you now, just a part of it. And at the um, groundbreaking, uh, Coolidge talks about a variety of different things. He talks about these five elements that make a, um, that make a that should make up a man's character. He talks about hard work, um, and he talks about 
uh, thrift. He talks about honesty. He talks about bearing burdens. And then he talks about faith. And what the reason I bring up that last one in particular is we can see where that faith element comes in in the cross. But what's really interesting is they've kind of co-opted from his talk because he actually talks about faith in others, faith in yourself, and faith in society. He makes no mention of religious faith. And so the uh, people who, while they wanted to honor President Coolidge through this window, they also kind of co-opted a little bit of his words to make it seem like a Christian faith, as opposed to just a general statement of faith in humanity. So thank you so much uh, for that question, Rick. Oh, no, that's not the question Rick asked. That was William. I apologize. Rick asked if I could speak a little bit to the Come Unto Me window, which we were actually talking a little bit about beforehand, but I'd be more than happy to. Um, the Come Unto Me window is the window that's in our narthex. And it's a really interesting window. It's a single pane of glass, a single lancet, as we see from that pointed top. And it was done by James Powell and Sons, which were actually out of London, not out of Dublin, as the book says. And they were called the White Friars. And what's really cool, and what I love about them, is they marked all of their stained glass with these tiny little friars, these little druid monks at the bottom corner. And as I was telling some people beforehand, we have four of their pieces of stained glass, but I can only find three of the monks. I can't find the other monk in the glass, and it just drives me crazy. So my foster son the other day actually said to me, did you ever find that monk? He heard me practicing or something. And I said, no. And he said, well, when the, we can go back in the chapel. Can you and I go try and find it? And I said, sure, we can more than happily go try and find a piece of stained glass, a monk in the stained glass. But the window um, comes from the scripture in Matthew 11, come unto me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. And we see uh, Jesus welcoming pilgrims of pilgrim family and their dog to the holy city. The holy city is behind Jesus. And now if you look in the Holy City, you might see a uh, building that you recognize, and that is our chapel. Now, whether Irving is saying that there are buildings like the chapel in the Holy City or that Mercersburg itself is the Holy City uh, is something that's lost to history. Um, but I love that um, this uh, is the chapel is placed in here. And we actually have three other spires that are similar. Doug Smith, our archivist, gave me a great scare one time when he came in and said, I actually don't think it's our chapel. I think it's St. Mary's in Oxford, which is what our church steeple is uh, built off af built at, uh, built after, modeled after. And it gave me quite a scare. The reason we know that it's our chapel is that there's actually, in our chapel, there are two um, spaces we can see here. I'll bring this up. This is how I teach my students when we talk about the stained glass. There's two spaces where the bells are right here. And at St. Mary's in Oxford, there's only one. So rest assured, this is our chapel and not St. Mary's in Oxford. Um, but I love this window, not just because of all these fun little things about it, but because of its placement. It's in the narthex. And unless you've spent time there as an, a chapel usher, you know, no one really stands in the narthex of our chapel. We all just kind of blaze through it into the sanctuary. And I think that this actually makes a really great statement about this window, because what does this scripture do? It invites you to rest. Come unto me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. So really, when you enter our chapel, the first window that you go by is an invitation to rest. But how often in our life do we just blow by this invitation and go on to the next thing? And isn't that a really great metaphor for life? How often when we've been invited to rest, when we've been invited to spend time with others, to do something that soothes our soul, do we just blow on to the next element on our to-do list? Um, so I actually think it's a really great window and where it's placed and whatnot. Um, George Price, um, you said that you will, uh, you as a 13-year-old boy, you were so impressed by the chapel, and I'm glad that I'm glad you were impressed then. I hope you're still impressed now. Um, and uh, Sean, you asked, how many presentations or topics have you created about the windows? Uh, let's see. Um, so I, I don't want to. So I think I can I can give you pretty much every window. I can give you a general synopsis of every window in the chapel. 
In fact, sometimes when class isn't going well, I will, or we're just kind of have a lull, I'll take a 10 minute break. I teach in the chapel and I'll invite my students to come up with me and I'll give them a little challenge. I say, find a window or find a space of the window and let me tell you about it. And this helps keep me fresh and things like that. Um, my wife, who, when I really started enjoying these pieces of stained glass, heard a lot about this, would probably tell you too many presentations, mostly to her. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Um, we do a lot of them. We do a stained glass chapel once a term where we actually wrap our liturgy around three different pieces of stained glass. We uh, wed one piece to the call to worship, another to the prayer of confession, and another to the affirmation of faith. And this does a number of things. One, it kind of breaks up our, our cycle. I think sometimes liturgy and worship are wonderful for the repetition, but sometimes liturgy and worship can be very challenging for the repetition. So this kind of breaks it up, but it allows us to engage with the windows. And what I'll do is I'll pick scriptures um, that tie, and calls to worships or prayer of confessions that tie into the window. And then I'll give about a five minute message on it. So in total, these three windows together, you get about a regular 15 minute homily sermon. Um, and actually, up until this term, when we uh, obviously are not having worship in the chapel anymore, we were about to complete every single piece of stained glass. This was going to be, we've done every, at least a reflection on every single piece. So I've done a lot of them. Um, I'll do them at, alum, a lot of you who have been to reunion weekend have heard me give these. Um, and I'll also give them to nursing homes or other groups that request them throughout the year. Um, one of the things I love about my role is that I get to be really, I, you know, one of the central, if not the central ambassador of this space. I mean, part of my job is to show people the wonders that lie in that chapel. And that is just so much fun to do. So I love giving these presentations. Um, and I love providing people uh, with those stories. Because as we said at the beginning, you know, the more we engage with them, the more we interact, the more they come to life, the more they can talk to us and they become our conversation partners, just like good music, just like good art does. And we recognize that different stories at different points and times in our life speak to us differently. And that can, that's a really profound thing um, that only grows with our appreciation. And as I also said, I teach on it too. So our students uh, tomorrow or Friday have uh, they could pick a window. They had to do a, a window. They had four different options from the ministry of Jesus, and they had to write a, a reflection on the window and look at the um, how the author depicted the scenes and if they depicted them well and had to read the scripture around it. And so we're really trying to have our students engage with these uh, windows in fun and in interesting ways. So uh, that's, that's a good answer to that, but a lot, Sean, is the short one. Well, th thanks again. You know, I, I want to uh, we stay mindful of time. I'm, I'm sure again, Will Will is welcome to uh, any any personal outreach or any questions that come up. Uh, but really, uh, thank you uh, for being interested. Thank you for being engaged. Uh, you know, tricky time we're in. I everyone, please take care of yourself. Stay in good health. Uh, once we're on the other side of this, uh, we are so excited to get you back back on campus and I, I, the tour in person is even more impressive uh, than this way uh, but again thank you thank you for joining us tonight thank you so thank you so much well thank you